systems. I'm Kathy Whitlock, I'm a professor of Earth Sciences, and uh, this Distinguished Visiting Lecture Series is an opportunity for us to bring in notable environmental scholars to our campus to talk about important topics and spend time with students and faculty, so we're really uh, glad that we can keep it going. And a lot of you are Kirk Johnson groupies, I think maybe you've seen him from my my 90-year-old mother to um, many much younger that we know about Kirk and the work he's been doing, and it's a pleasure to have him with us this evening. Kirk Johnson is the SANT director of the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, and he's one of the country's leading paleontologists. Now, I first met Kurt during my graduate student days at the University of Washington when he was a high schooler working at the Burke Museum. And even as a kid, Kirk was so gung-ho about fossils, and it was really easy to see that he was going to go places. Uh, he went on to get his bachelor's at Amherst College and a master's from University of Pennsylvania and a PhD in geology and paleontology at Yale University. I reconnected with Kurt when I got my first job at Carnegie Museum, and he was still a graduate student at Yale. And uh, among other things, we worked uh, with a team of paleontologists to describe the fossils in a Miocene lake deposit up in the Arctic. And that was a very that was a, that was a very fun collaboration. It was great to bring all those different threads together. And then since then, I followed Kurt's career closely from Yale to the Denver Museum of Natural History and Science, and now to the Smithsonian. As director of the Smithsonian, Kirk oversees more than 440 employees, and he is responsible for a collection of over 140 million objects. It's the largest natural history collection in the world. The museum hosts more than seven million visitors annually, and last year, its scientists published over 760 scientific research papers and described more than 300 new species. That's really unbelievable. As a paleontologist, Kirk continues to lead expeditions around the world, and he's the, responsible for the discovery of over 1,400 fossil sites. His research focuses on fossil plants and the extinction of dinosaurs, and he's known through his scientific articles, popular books, museum exhibitions, documentaries, and collaborations with artists. In 2010 to 2011, he led the excavation of an Ice Age site near Snowmass Village, Colorado, that recovered over literally thousands of bones of mammoths, mastodons, and other Ice Age animals. This dig was featured, and maybe many of you have seen it, in the NOVA documentary, Ice Age Death Trap, and in Johnson's book, Digging Snow Mastodon, Discovering an Ice Age World in the Colorado Rockies. His recent documentaries include a three-part NOVA series called Making North America, which aired on PBS networks in November of 2015, and The Great Yellowstone Thaw, which premiered in PBS in June 2017. So let's welcome Kirk Johnson. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Kathy. I'm going to go to film mode. Go dark. So I want to talk about natural history in the age of humans. And we're in this amazing time when people have become a geologic force. We're also in a time when most people don't know what the words natural history mean. When you ask people in the streets what natural history means, they go, history? Oh, that's boring. I'm like, no, no, natural history. But it's really a 19th century term. And 19th century is when the first big natural history museums were formed. And this is my favorite one. This is the uh, Museum of Comparative Zoology in Paris. And it is an amazing thing. It's in one room, they have mounted the skeletons of all the mammals of the world that were known in 1890. And uh, you walk in there, you go, wow, OK, evolution, I get it. All mammals are variation on a theme. It's just like one quick shot, and you've got the answer. And I've always been really compelled by museums because the museums are places that, that keep the real stuff. That's where you can actually see all the real things. 
And if you think about it, our species, Homo sapiens, has been collecting stuff for a couple of hundred years and putting it in buildings in major cities as a way to understand the natural world. And we continue to do that, and it's an amazing thing. Now, the museum that I'm now the director of is the U.S. National Museum. It was, um, it's part of the Smithsonian, but it um, was very instrumental in planning the 1876 expedition, exposition in Philadelphia, where a whole bunch of stuff was shown and displayed in the centennial of the United States. And then once the centennial was over, all the stuff was put in uh, trains and taken to Washington, D.C., which forced the Smithsonian to build a new museum, the first U.S. National Museum, and it named as its first director this guy named George Brown Good. And here he is, he's on the far left, standing there. Picture's taken in 1888, he was, became the director in 1881, and they built the Arts and Industries building. He really wanted some Easter Island heads for the Smithsonian, so he launched an expedition, and here these two heads are, um, and the one on the left is still right in my museum when you walk into it. I'm 26 directors downstream from George Brown Good, but he's sort of my hero, because he is what they called a new museum man. His logic was that for much of the 19th century, museums had existed, but they were really for specialists to study collections of things. And he realized that with people being urbanized, and coming to cities, leaving the farms, that people wanted to come see this stuff as well. He said, hey, museums really have to have three separate missions. These amazing collections of objects, the experts that study them, and this educational function. So these three legs of the stool. That was George Brown Good's real insight and that uh, amazing thing. He, he was the director from 1881 to 1896 and he died at the ripe old age of 46 years old. An incredibly influential guy and really shaped the um, museum world. So here it is, the three core elements of natural history museums, scientific research, collections, and the audience. Or think about it like this, just communication, new knowledge, and valued objects. And that's the three plates that I spin as a museum director. For me, they're all equally important. I preserve the national collections, I support the scientists and scholars who study them, and I'm highly focused on the public that visits and gains informal science learning from experiencing our exhibits. Now, 19th century natural history museums are kind of interesting. They pretty much all start in a narrow window of time, and the really big ones started pretty much between 1880 and 1920. And these are big temple-like buildings that appear in major cities in Europe and North America. Here's the Smithsonian Castle. This is early in the game. This is opened in 1856. And as you recall, the Smithsonian is a, a weird organization. It was founded by a gift from an English chemist who never visited the United States. His name was James Smithson. He, in his will, he willed to the United States for uh, 500,000 crowns for the uh, creation of an institution in the city of Washington uh, for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. A very Enlightenment-like <laughs> statement, a very Humboldtian-like statement that we would build an institution whose entire function was to grow and diffuse knowledge. Different from a university, but really grow and diffuse knowledge. And, and uh, George Brown Good also was very good at convincing people to build museums. And this is the opening of the Field Museum in Chicago, which opened in 1921. And you can see that George Brown Good was right. People wanted to go see this thing. Here are people streaming across the boardwalk to go see this amazing temple to the natural world. And these natural museums really were temples. You look at them, they have this very classic architecture. It's like a temple, it's like a church, but it's all about the natural world and humanity's place in it. This uh, field museum grew out of the 1893 exposition, the Columbia Exposition that happened in Chicago. They built the museum and opened it at the <coughs> But it had been George Brown Good in 1887 that convinced the city fathers of Chicago they needed to build a big museum. So he was responsible really for both the U.S. National Museum and the Field Museum. And uh, it makes you think about the kind of people who would go see a museum in 1921. So take this guy, for instance. This is a a typical American citizen of the turn of the century. He was born in 1879 in England. He um, immigrated to the United States in 1896, moved to Rollins, Wyoming, became kind of a cowhand. He was, um, you know, the census from that time shows him living, boarding in a house in Wyoming. He uh, eventually, so he's 21 years old at the year 1900, he started out as a cowhand and became actually a rancher. 
He um, eventually, by 1908, he got a ranch south of Casper, Wyoming. Here's the ranch as it looks today. And uh, typical of the time, he was very curious about how he might find a wife in the obscure badlands of southern Wyoming. And he met Lucille Shaw, who was a school teacher from Denver. And she was um, living in Denver in 1908 when the Colorado Museum of Natural History opened up. And here it is. This is the Carter Museum, which opened in City Park in Denver in 1908. Lucille Shaw would have been 15 years old in 1908. So here she is as a 15-year-old. This museum in Denver, note that Denver was a little bit less ambitious than Chicago in terms of its opulent, but still a temple to the natural world. I haven't ever got direct evidence that Lucille Shaw went on opening day, but it's hard to imagine that a 15-year-old living down the street in Denver would not have gone there at that time. At any rate, eventually she became a school teacher in Southern Wyoming. She met um, Bert Pierce. They had five kids, the youngest of which was um, a young cowgirl named Katie Jo. Uh, before I get on to Katie Jo, I want to show you two things about that Denver Museum. One is if you think about why these museums were being founded between 1880 and 1920, it was in part because people were moving to the cities, but it's also because people are becoming aware that people were impacting the natural world. And you think about the origins of the conservation movement, you think of Teddy Roosevelt leaving his office in 1908 and going to Africa to collect specimens for the Smithsonian, the awareness that bison were disappearing, that the forests were being chopped down in Colorado for mine timbers. And ironically, these two bison, specimens number one and number two of the Colorado Museum, were part of the last herd of bison in Colorado. So here you have the first specimens, part of the last herd. This herd was, was um, living in South Park, Colorado, and the museum got two of the last small herd. So even in the 1890s, 1910s, people are thinking, museums are, are thinking about conservation of the natural world and what's gonna happen as we um, change the world rapidly. They were also finding remarkable fossils at the time, and here's um, a giant mammoth from Nebraska that was put on display in the museum in 1911. And you can see the staff of the museum there. This is Jesse Dade Figgins, who was the director of the museum, who came from the American Museum in New York to found the Denver Museum. So back to Bert Pierce and his wife, Lucille. Um, Lucille was clearly a museum goer. I have found a letter from her sent from Washington, D.C. in 1939. She was a, one of the daughters of the American Revolution, so she'd go back to Washington, D.C. Here she is writing a letter to her two, two of her sons, Warren and Leroy, and a picture of the Smithsonian cast, 1939. And then here's her youngest daughter, Katie Jo Pierce, a uh, little cow girl, who happens to be my mom. <laughs> so here I am with Bert Pierce in 1963. So this is a guy, now think about this, this is a guy that was 21 years old in the year 1900. He's my grandfather, not my great grandfather, that's me sitting on his lap in 1963. And know what I'm doing, I am fondling his golden pocket watch, which I presently own. <laughs> and I can tell you that I was obsessed with time since a very young age. And what's amazing to me about this story is that people think that the 19th century is a long time ago, but it just isn't. My grandfather was 21 years old in 1900. And I'm standing in front of you now. And you think about how time passes, and you realize that a tremendous amount has happened in the last century, and it's not that long ago. And all that to say that the next century is going to go by pretty fast, too. And you know people, and there are people in this room, who will be alive in the year 2100, or be citizens of the 22nd century. So, as a museum person, I lay claim to the fact that museums are forever places. We preserve memories of the past, and we put a sense of time onto the place that we live in. And you think about it, most people's perception of the past is pretty strange, and their perception of the future is sort of like, what am I having for lunch today? <laughs> We live in a really fast time, but time comes in many flavors, and I want to argue for you to start thinking about time in terms of the last century and the next century. Um, I'm a paleontologist, and I think of time both in what am I having for lunch tomorrow, and is what happened last hundred years and what's happening in the next hundred years, and what happened during the grand scope of life on Earth. And my friend Ray Troll and I have had a great time for the last 20 years driving around the American West 
collecting fossils, meeting fossil people, and Ray is this amazing <coughs> artist who can render anything with a sense of humor. And you can see, there I am up there, there's Ray, there's a dog I don't own, there's my shovel, I own 72 shovels, and there's a jackalope. <laughs> it's all good. And we're standing on top of the great stack of geologic time, which is the home of fossils, which is the story of our planet. And fossils are the memory of our planet, in the same way that artifacts and museums are the memory of our culture. And it makes me think about time in terms of humans and population. And this is the curve that just blows my mind every time I look at it, is world population for humans had been well underneath a billion for a long time. When my grandfather was born, it was under two billion. And if you actually map on my family onto this curve, which today was like 7.6 billion people on the planet, map my family onto it, here it is. 1879, there were less than two billion people. When my mom was born, there were two billion. When I was born, there were three billion. When my nephew and niece were born, there were seven billion. And in the six years since my nephew and niece were born, 600 million people have been added to the world population. So from a biological point of view, you see a curve like this, you go, hmm, okay, that's a very interesting curve. And it makes me think very hard about the next end of this century, the next 80 years of this century. And it's very clear that this time, the time we're in, is really genuinely and utterly unique in the span of human history. I would argue that the 20th century was really unusual when compared with the last 3,000 centuries, which is how long we've been around. Humans have been around for 300,000 years or 3,000 centuries. And the one that we're living in now is utterly unique in all ways. People tend to think all oh, things have always been the same. They haven't. We're living in a time that is demonstrably and utterly unique, which makes me think that working in a natural history museum at this point in time in my life and at this point in time of human history is a really interesting thing to be doing. But look at what happened since my grandfather was 21 years old. This just shows percentage of American households and 1900 and 2005 Things like telephones, cars, stoves, radios, refrigerators, electricity, washers, dryers, microwaves, dishwashers, all the technology you take for granted all happened since my grandfather was 21 years old. It's kind of remarkable that he lived with none of those things. Here's a cool little diagram. You can see the date on it. This is December 8, 1982. That's six months after I graduated from college. This is the map of the DARPANET, which is the precursor of the internet. Each one of those nodes is four computers. That's it, that's the entire internet in 1982. <laughs> Think about it now, with its tens of millions of computers. This happened since I graduated from college. And so this sense that we are living in a world that is rapidly accelerating is actually a, a really a relatively true manifestation of what's going on. You live in a time that's changing so fast, you can barely keep track of it. So here is another retrial drawing from our upcoming book that's coming out this summer. It's called Cruising the Fossil Coastline, and it's about the history of the West Coast, which is an amazing coast. It's a <coughs> coast that's been a coast for almost three quarters of a billion years, and coastal fossils are amazing. So Ray was forced to draw another time scale, but you'll notice he added another time period, the Anthropocene, the age of humans. At the top, you can see beer bottles and shovels and tires and stuff like <laughs> Did the fossils of our time. What will the fossils of our time look like? And the last book was in 2007. We weren't thinking about the Anthropocene just in 2007, but we sure are now. The world has changed that much that in the last decade, iPhones have evolved and Ray Troll and I have evolved. And I tend to think of the Anthropocene, the age of humans, in sort of two phases. What I call the Anthropocene 1.0 is the um, effects of humanity in the form of the direct impacts of human actions, right? the overhunting of elephants, the poaching of elephants. Somebody's actually shooting an elephant, that's a direct impact. Or the direct clearing of tropical rainforests to plant soybeans. Or the direct polluting, polluting of a harbor by dumping waste into the harbor. Things you literally, physically do as humans. So a good example of this would be this patch of Bolivian rainforest in 1975 the exact same patch of rainforest in 2003. The rainforest is converted to soybean fields in 25 years. And that was done by individual Bolivian people who wanted a better life and they cut down trees and planted soybeans. There it is. So that's 
one thing. But then there's the Anthropocene 2.0, which is the one that kind of snuck up on us and caught us by surprise. It's the indirect impact of humanity. It's things we do by our existence, but we don't intend to do them. We're not actually deciding to chop down a tree. We just live our lives, and as a result, things happen. And probably the best example of this is what's called the healing curve. This is the measurement of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere, measured by one guy, Charles de Healy, who started measuring in 1957. And when he passed away um, in 2005, his son took over the measurements. So they keep measuring these things. And you can see that the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere goes from 315 up to, in February of this year, was 408. So it's gone about 25% in those 57 years. And it's a relevant curve to me because my mom and dad met right there. I was born there, and I'm standing in front of you right here. So that curve is exactly my life. So whenever the composition of an atmospheric gas on planet Earth changes by 25% in the time it takes to grow one of these, it's worth paying attention. Like we are actually doing a geologic thing, and humans are actually a geologic force, where we weren't in previous centuries. We've been around for 3,000 centuries, and in the last century, we became a geologic force. And with that force comes a certain amount of responsibility. The manifestation of Anthropocene 2.0 are things like this. This is a, uh, a rendition of Arctic floating sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. And sea ice is interesting. It, it waxes and wanes. In the winter, it grows. And so this is the, September 1980, two years before I graduated from college. And this is the end of the uh, melting season. So this is the minimum sea ice in 1980. In the in maximum 1980, it would have come down to about here. So this is winter, this is summer, end of the summer. If you jump forward to 2012, you've lost this much Arctic sea ice. Right? This amazing thing. And this is the, what's happening here is the ocean is warming, it's melting the ice, and this is the minimum of the ice. So we're seeing dramatic impacts of global warming on things like Arctic sea ice. i just give you one example of Anthropocene 1.0 and 2.0, just to give you the sense that we're now seeing two types of human impacts. Things that we intend to do when we actually do by our own agency, and things we didn't intend to do and happen by accident. No one expected that we would emit carbon and it would cause uh, greenhouse gases to rise so fast. There were people, of course, who knew that carbon dioxide was a greenhouse gas and knew that there might be impacts. But it wasn't really until the late 80s that we became aware that, hey, this is actually happening. We actually are doing something as humans that is significant on a global slash geologic scale. Let's go back to museums now. Museums look at time in two major scales. They look at time in terms of what's happened over our own history, that is, the history of the museums. And most museums only date back to the 1880s, so the last 150 years or so. And they also look at Earth's long history. And you think about it, here's the museum I worked at in Denver, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And um, they're big on dioramas. They make capsules. And when I was at Denver, it occurred to me, I said, wait a minute, people went to those places and sampled those places and brought them back. I wonder if you can go relocate those places and see what it looked like. Because dioramas, in fact, are time capsules. And at the Denver Museum, we had 26 Colorado dioramas. These are 26 places in Colorado that were visited between 1938 and 1976. Each of these dioramas exist. And we dispatched our photographers and a whole bunch of our volunteers. We said, go find this place. Is this place really a place that the artists went to and rebuilt, or did they fabricate it? And it turned out that we've been able to find all but four of these places. And we can do the before and after photographs, which is really quite remarkable. So here's the coyote den. The top is the diorama. The bottom is what the place looks like right now. You can see they actually have the exact same outcrop. Um, and you know, the, maybe the, the top of the den has collapsed here. You can see it was intact there. The bushes have changed a little bit, but it's pretty much exactly the same place. But this view of Long's Peak, this rocky field at Long's Peak, and this is interesting because the uh, the rocks are rounder in the paintings than they are in real. <laughs> I mean, you start to see the, the little bit of cheat that the artist did. But by and large, it was remarkable how much these things had changed. Here's a site down south of Denver, Colorado, which was going to be a site of a reservoir. There was going to be a dam right here that didn't get built. But you can see the power lines coursing across the site. 
And we realized that these are literally time capsules that were like as close as we could render a place. Um, here's what it looked like when we installed it. And with these 104 dioramas, they're time capsules of local landscapes that tell you how things have changed. We had one up in Alaska that we couldn't locate. And, one, and finally, some guy walked into the museum who had done his master's thesis on that site. And he came to me and said, hey, my master's thesis is one of my, your dioramas. I was like, oh, that's great. We've never seen that one. We went to the site. And the glacier that seen that diorama had dropped 500 feet of elevation mm. since we painted the diorama. So these dioramas are like literal physical snapshots of ancient landscapes. And there's also the long history of Earth, the good stuff, the fossils, right? You know that I'm a paleontologist. I am a shovel-ready scientist. <laughs> and when I was at Denver, I had uh, teams. We trained literally hundreds of people to become citizen science paleontologists. And we were sort of arcing out the success that the Museum of the Rockies had had, the realization that the American West is one of the great fossil fields in the world, that fossils show up in urban settings. You can go out and dig them. You're literally, the world is just at your fingertips if you live in the American West and you own a shovel. It's an amazing thing. You can go out and crack up on rocks and find remarkable fossil plants. Um, and it is once you realize this, there is really no going back. I mean, if you love making discoveries and you know that you can just go drive somewhere and get out and dig a hole and find incredible stuff, you dream about it at night. It's remarkable. And this is a, a site we were digging in 1994 in Alberta. It was a fossil plant site. We were digging this layer right in here. And uh, we kept digging and we kept digging in the bottom of the layer. We found something that wasn't a fossil leaf. It was this, which looked pretty odd to me. But you can see the skull. It's a very nice skull. And there's some neck bones. And once we dug it completely out, it was the most complete dinosaur I've ever seen, an ostrich dinosaur, Stuthiomimus in the bottom of one of my leaf holes. And that, all I have to say is, when you look for one thing, you often find another. And that's sort of the nature of science, is that when you look for one thing, you find another. When you're trying to discover one thing, you discover another thing. So the act of looking is extremely important. That's what science is about, persistent curiosity, persistent looking, persistent observation. And you find these remarkable things that you never expected to find. And if you realize that layers of rock are literally cross-sections of ancient landscapes turned to rock. When you look at something like a coal mine, you actually see that landscape in your mind. So you look at the coal mine and you see the coal. I look at the coal mine and I see the swamp that made the coal. I can time travel <laughs> with a shovel. <laughs> it's just that simple, right? You talk about time travel as a science fiction thing, just go dig a hole. <laughs> So this is uh, when we were making the uh, making North America thing for Nova, we went to a beach in Alaska, which had some, I'd been to the year before and I found some fossil leaves. So I was looking for little fossil leaves. And as we were there with the film crew trying to reconstruct my discovery of fossil leaves, I found a little tiny piece of a palm frond. I'm like, wow, I never knew there was a palm frond here. And the tide was coming up. We weren't finding anything. I had a couple of guys with me who said, let's just keep popping. We maybe get something big and flashy. And within a few minutes before the tide covered over the outcrop, we popped up this slab of a giant palm frond. Mm -hmm. You can see the base of the palm frond there. I'm going to show you. We ended up pulling out the adjacent rocks and cleaning up in the lab. And here's what it looks like today. <laughs> the seven foot wide palm frond. And I, did I mention it was in Alaska? <laughs> if you think about climate change, the words Alaska and palm, work for you? Where do you go to see palms today? Palm trees live where it's warm. You go to the south to see palm trees. But 50 million years ago, there were palm trees in Alaska. There were, here was Alaska 50 million years ago. Time travel is so well. It takes you back in time to places that you can never go to today and places that don't exist today. So paleontology not only lets you time travel, it lets you visit ancient Earths that existed in different places. And one of the big insights from this is that Earth has gone through tremendous climate change and there are two different types of planet Earth. There's ice house Earth, which we live in today, where there are polar ice sheets. And there's greenhouse Earth, which we don't live in today, where there are polar forests. And if you look at this graph, which shows the last 600 million years of time, so here's today, this is 600 million years ago, 
And this is latitude. And what you're seeing here, north latitude or south latitude, doesn't matter. The blue bars are when ice exists and the latitude at which ice exists. So you can see that 300 million years ago, there was ice sheets down to latitude 30, which should mean there was ice sheets on top of us here. The most recent ice age started pretty recently. And we're still in it now. And, and at the peak of the ice age, you had la ice down to latitude 40. But note, the main point of this graph is that for most of Earth history, there have not been ice sheets. We live in sort of an anomalous time. Our time is the ice house time, but it's sort of anomalous time. Within ice house Earth, there are two conditions. Cool periods, which we live in today, the interglacials, and cold periods, the glacials, when ice is at lower latitudes. So here's today. This is an interglacial, and there's a glacial. And over the last two million years, this happened about 24 times. <coughs> I mean, that's pretty amazing. The ice came down and melted back. It came down and melted back. Repeat 24 times. I'm going to not do 24 times. <laughs> Maybe I will do 24 times. Just think about this. How does the ice come down? What it means is when the ice builds up, it means that snow falls in the winter and it survives the summer. More, small, more snow falls and it survives the next summer. That's how you build up ice. How do you get rid of it? You just leave the refrigerator door open and it melts. So you have to have long periods of cold summers to build up an ice sheet and periods of warm winters to melt an ice sheet. This is a cool time period. This is a time that Kathy and her team studies here, this time when you have these inner, inner glacials and glacials of ice sheets coming down, melting back, coming down. And if you actually look at North America now, what you realize is it's dead obvious now that you know what you've seen. This is the footprint of the ice sheet. Hudson's Bay is the center of it. It was depressed down and pushed down. It's literally the footprint of the ice sheet. Here are these, this ring of lakes, um, the edge of the ice sheet. When the ice was here, there was a lot of it. And I'm from Seattle. We used the Space Needle in Seattle as our measuring stick. It's 603 feet tall. 18,000 years ago, there were 3,000 feet of ice in Seattle. Five space needles. Same in Boston and New York. 18,000 years ago. That's four pyramids ago. I want to think about it that way. It's, it's not that long ago. There was 3,000 feet of ice in Seattle. You know, I was always a greenhouse guy. I liked really old fossils. I didn't think much about the ice ages, but then I was minding my own business in my office in Denver in October of 2010. I got a phone call from Snowmass Village. And here's the ski area. Aspen's right around the corner. Here's Snowmass Village. There's the ski slopes. Here's a little tiny round lake surrounded by a round ridge of gravel. The city of Snowmass had decided to drain the water out of the lake, dig a bunch of dirt out of it, put a dam in there, could put water in there to do snow making in the winter. And also so they could flush the toilets when all the tourists were there. <laughs> They drained the water out, they rolled the bulldozer through it, and the first thing they found, there's the reservoir, the first thing they found was right there. This is what this is, is a whole bunch of very concerned construction guys. <laughs> <laughs> They're extremely unhappy because they had just put the bulldozer right through a mammoth skeleton. A whole skeleton. So they, they literally the guy driving the dozer had ribs coming over the top of the blade. <laughs> he was scared to death. They all got out and the foreman's like, hmm, this is not a cow. <laughs> There's no way we can convince anybody it's a cow. So we better call somebody. We get a call. It's like, yes. They call me. <laughs> so we run up there and it was amazing because there were ivory tusks coming out of the ground. I mean, ivory tusks, you just pick them up. It was like... It's, this preservation was remarkable. And so we responded <laughs> with my shovel army. It's always good to have a shovel army to uh, dispose onto these certain things. We had um, a, a lot of tense negotiations, and I agreed that we have 70 days to dig. We had 300 diggers, and we dug it for 70 days. And we got the most remarkable things. We collected these phenomenal <laughs> fossils. Everybody had their Flintstone moment. It was just incredible. <laughs> we found, this is a femur of a, a mastodon, we found 6,500 large bones in 70 days. Parts of 50 mastodons, 12 mammoths, 
eight giant ground sloths. I mean, it was awesome. We found this skull of a giant longhorn bison, bison ladder fronds, seven feet wide, horn tip to horn tip, broken on both ends. It probably would have been 11 feet had it been intact. And we found this entire fauna, camels, horses, deer, giant bison, ground sloths, mammoths, and mastodons. That was an awesome 70 days. It was <laughs> super good. And actually, tomorrow, I'm going to give it a talk tomorrow afternoon. It will be a talk about this thing because it, it, it's worth its own talk. So come back tomorrow afternoon. And we'll find out where the talk is tomorrow afternoon, right? Okay. <laughs> we'll crash whatever talk that is. But you should come back and give a story of Snowmass. I'm moving on from Snowmass now. It was the best 70 days I ever had in my life. But just to say that I became a real aficionado of ice ages after Snowmass. But I spent most of my life in the greenhouse earth where there are warm periods and there are temperate <coughs> forests in the polar regions and hot periods where there are some tropical forests in the polar regions. So here are, here's the world 50 million years ago, no ice at all. And when I was just a little bit older than after I met Kathy the first time, I got on this amazing expedition up to Ellsmere Island. So here's the Arctic Circle. There's the North Magnetic Pole. When you're in Ellsmere Island, the, your compass is point southwest because <coughs> you're north of the North Pole. And the sun doesn't set for three months at a time. The sun just goes around in the sky like this. An amazing place. I went with this incredible woman, Mary Dawson, who at the time, was, I don't know how old she was now, but she's still alive now. It's 30 years later, and she looks exactly like this. So I, <laughs> I think Mary Dawson is like 150 or something. But, you know, there was four of us, and we went up there for two summers, um, two periods. And we were on places like this is actual hybrid island. It's the size of Ireland. It's uninhabited. The size of Ireland. We walked around and just collected fossils. On Ellesmere Island, here's one of the most amazing photographs I've ever seen. This is the edge of an ice sheet sitting on the landmass, and there is a waterfall that's 300 feet high. Hmm. It's a deceptive photograph. There I am at the base of that cliff. Um, and we flew around in helicopters, and we saw these coal seams. Here we are, like 2,000 miles north of the nearest living tree. And in the coal seams are these crumbled rocks. If you walk up to those rocks, they are, in fact, petrified trees. <laughs> and there are petrified forests. <laughs> and you can poke around at the bottom of the petrified trees and find the fossil leaves. And there's Metasequoia, the Don Redwood, which grows today in central China. And here is the center of a fossil lotus leaf. So here's a reconstruction of what this place looks like. We found incredible for animal fossils. We found um, large hippo like griffodons. We found turtles and snake fossils and crocodile fossils. We found a fauna that would be more at home in the Okefenokee Swamp in the High Arctic. That blew my mind, that experience. In the early 2000s, there was a cool expedition to the center of the Arctic Ocean, which is covered in sea ice. Out in the middle of the Arctic Ocean, they drilled the bottom of the seafloor to a place called the Monazov Ridge, which is 8,000 feet down. And they drilled into the seafloor mud and brought up a sample. You normally expect to find fossil marine plankton when you do that. But what they brought up was not fossil marine plankton. In fact, were the spore of an aquatic fern called Azola. It's a little floating aquatic fern, mm -hmm. which grows in warm waterways. Here's a picture I took in the Brazilian Amazon of a lake covered with floating Azola ferns. This is your Arctic Ocean of 50 million years ago. In a warm world, you have lots of freshwater runoff, and this, the Arctic Ocean basin is restricted. There's a lens of fresh water on top of the salty Arctic Ocean, and you have freshwater ferns floating at the North Pole in the warm world. Kind of blew my mind, and it makes you wonder how fast we get back to that world. And that's really the question that has climate scientists a little bit agitated right now, is we know that we're warming the world, and the question is, <laughs> How fast, and how fast does ice respond to a warming world? And we know that the immediate ramifications of a warming world will be increased sea level, which will impact human structures along the coastlines. But there will be other factors that will happen. So we're, we're alert to this topic right now. And what I find so useful is that the fossil record really shows you what has happened, which means it shows you what could happen. Does this just show you how fast it will happen? And that's where the level of uncertainty lives right now. And if it's going to take 1,000 years, do we really care? Maybe. If it's going to take 100 years? It seems like a long time. But remember, you own the next century. I demonstrated with my grandfather, you already own the next century. So if it takes 100 years, it's not lunch. It's 
impacting people that you know. So it's this context that made me leave Denver, which I didn't want to leave Denver at all because I loved Denver a lot and I loved being able to drive out of Denver and collect fossils within 20 minutes of the museum. But when they invited me to come to Washington DC and run the Smithsonian, I thought, why would I do that? Because Washington DC, I mean, it's, it's cool and stuff, but it's not near fossils. Why would I? Why would I go there? But I started paying attention to what was going on. And, and the Washington, D.C. is an interesting thing. This is the mall in Washington. This is the Smithsonian. You can see there's, there's the White House over here. There's the Washington Monument. The Capitol's over here. These are all Smithsonian museums. Our government wraps itself in museums. There's 19 Smithsonian museums. And the Natural History Museum is this one. It's the world's largest natural history museum all by itself. And when I kind of did the numbers, and I realized we get 7 million visitors a year, but they're mainly different visitors every year because they're all tourists. And I did a little bit of math. I said, wait a minute, seven million a year, let's say one million are local, that means it's six million are unique tourists, which means that in 10 years there's 60 million people in the building. And if you believe like I do that natural history museums are deeply relevant and they actually help people understand the natural world, how could I not go run a place where in 10 years I would see 60 million people have a chance to influence their view of planet Earth? So I took the job of this remarkable museum, which has 500 scientists working at a given time. And since the five years since I got there, we've published almost 5,000 papers and described almost 2,000 new species. It's a really impactful scientific organization. Every year, 7 million visitors, but over the time I've been there, 35 million people have been there. And a collection of 145 million objects. It gives me the ability to do really cool things, like here I am deputizing 400 kids as junior paleontologists to go forth and save the world children. Uh, we have amazing exhibits that put people in the space where they can understand the natural world or kind of come face to face with their ancestors. And we've been tackling some of the harder topics too, like genomics and emerging infectious diseases, topics that are hard to talk about because they're complicated, but the museum lets you take the topics apart and make them understandable. We're doing research all around the world in 160 countries, submarines, we're monitoring reefs, um, studying tropical rainforests. We have people that are down in submarines um, at the mid-water level, like 700,000 feet down, collecting these incredible things no one's ever seen before. Um, we're in the tropical rainforests using insecticides to gas trees so we can get like thousands of species out of a single tree insect. But we're still understanding what's on planet Earth right now. Um, when a whale comes ashore, we go get it. We have the National Whale Collection with literally hundreds of whale skeletons. We have the National Parasite Collection. Here's the curator of the National Parasite Collection. 20 million parasites. We have pickled gorillas, which we can CAT scan to understand the roots of human cardiac disease. This is a map that shows where our specimens come from. You'll note everywhere except for Russia, more or less. <laughs> and we have these remarkable warehouses. This is the true Raiders of the Lost Ark place. I and mean, we have unbelievably vast collections that represent our nation's exploration of the whole world. And we are, if you think about this, the 20th, 20th century was an American century. We are by far and away the largest natural history museum in the world. The next closest is London with half the size. Here's our ethnology collections and ethnography collections. Here are our fossil collections. Here's our mineral collections. Here's our plant collections, five million specimens. Here's our algae collections, our shell collections, our human skeleton collections. We have 30,000 human skeletons. Here's our butterfly collections and our bird collections and our whale collections. Um, and our mosquito collections. It turns out we have 1.7 million mosquitoes <laughs> with 32,000 squirrels. Uh, <laughs> the mosquitoes are amazing, though, because mosquitoes are real major um, disease vectors. And I have a team from the Army that works in the museum on mosquitoes. And presently, they're deployed to Syria, where they're sampling human diseases at refugee camps by collecting the mosquitoes. The mosquitoes are actually sampling the population. Uh, it's a remarkable thing. We have people looking at bird strikes on planes. In invasive pests in um, ships and ballast water on boats coming in. There's a whole bunch of practical stuff that we do. We're in the process of making our collections digital. We're scanning herbarium sheets now at a rate of 5,000 a day. We scanned 1.1 million herbarium sheets last year. We have frozen tissues. We're trying to collect frozen tissues of all living species 
Um, we've just, since we started this project three years ago, we've got um, 30,000 species on ice. And we're also monitoring all the world's volcanoes, which is kind of cool. There's 1,554 active volcanoes on planet Earth. And we keep a daily record of all those volcanoes. And you'll note there are volcanoes that are worse than other ones. The red dots are where there's large population centers near um, active volcanoes. So all this brings me back to Montana. And you'll recognize Jack Corner. And that's Kathy Wonkel, who discovered the Wonkel Rex. And uh, back a couple of years ago, we arrived with a FedEx truck. And you guys gratefully loaned us um, the Wonkel Rex, which we zoomed back to Washington, D.C., because we're building uh, an exhibit which opens in 422 days from now. It's uh, called Deep Time. It's a history of life on Earth. It's our biggest ever exhibit we've ever built. It's 31,000 square feet. It's the history of life on Earth from the very beginning all the way to the present, and it doesn't stop in the present. It goes into the future. It goes into the future so it, you can see yourself in the history of life on Earth. And it challenges all 60 million of those visitors every decade to think of themselves as agents of the future. Humans are geologic agents. You get to drive the planet now. You broke it, you bought it. <laughs> and you know that kids love dinosaurs and kids are going to own this planet for the next 100 years. We want to give them a toolkit to do that. Here's the unveiling of the Wonkel Rex, which was in part mediated by the, um, that's Pat Leegy from the Museum of the Rockies. That's, um, General Bostick from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers who owns the T-Rex. They loaned it to us for 50 years, and that's in the middle of the rotunda at the museum. That's the femur of the Rex. Here's the mount of the Rex as it's gonna go in. It's munching on a triceratops. If you like triceratops, this is a very awful picture. <laughs> Here's the, the last view. This whole exhibit with its view to the future opens next June 8th in Washington, D.C. You should all come and see it. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.